Remember the mantra? The most common blue pattern is H. pylori gastritis. The most common pink pattern is reactive gastropathy. So, let's talk about reactive gastropathy. So, perfect example of reactive gastropathy. As you can see, this is the antrum. Reactive gastropathy is best seen in its majestic form in the antrum. In the body fundic mucosa, the changes are muted, tend to be very subtle. All right, so let's list the features. Feature number one hits you on the head here. Serrated profile. Notice these saw tooth like profiles. Perfect. Feature number two loss of mucin. So those apical cups of mucin have virtually disappeared. Better seen on the next power. Feature number three edema. Feature number four muscle. Mm, I don't really see it, but that's okay. Feature number five. Those congested, dilated vascular channels, they're not too obvious. Feature number six, it's the absence of significant inflammation. Right? Check, 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 check. Did I get six? Again, serrations, loss of mucin. Up here, that's normal foveolar mucin, that large apical cup. Down here, this is loss of mucin. You've lost that apical cup of mucin. And down here, you have virtually no mucin whatsoever. You know I don't talk mechanism, but this is just too interesting to let go. Basically, what is reactive gastropathy? It is nothing but an expansion of the foveolar compartment, and it expands so much that it collapses on itself, and hence, in my head, that's how the serrated architecture is created. So the five features of reactive gastropathy are loss of mucin, that serrated corkscrew appearance of the pits, the lamina propria edema and congested capillary channels, the smooth muscle proliferation, which was not there in this case, and by definition, very little or no inflammation. So the next question is, what is the etiology behind reactive gastropathy? Fundamentally, this is a pattern of injury. The stomach, unfortunately, has only a few ways of telling us that something has hurt it. The stomach is not like human reactions. We laugh, we cry, we frown. So it's a pattern of injury. It is not really a diagnosis. That said, there are a few things you must consider when you make a diagnosis of reactive gastropathy. And I like to divide them into two groups. One is when reactive gastropathy hits you on the head. It is obvious. It screams back at you. And these are the conditions you must consider when that happens to you. And always remember, the tissue adjacent to an ulcer always looks reactive. The second class is where the changes are subtle. It just taps you on the head, does not hit you on the head. And unfortunately, in, in everyday practice, we see this all the time, but we seldom know what the, in, the injurious agent is. And often you'll find NSAID. The problem there is that a significant proportion of the population is on NSAID. Is the NSAID truly related to the changes that you're seeing in the stomach? And often you never know. Here's a practical problem that we face every day. Here's a gastric biopsy. There's some serration here. There's perhaps a little bit of mucin. Do I call this reactive gastropathy? Or do I call this mild chronic gastritis? There's definitely an increase in lymphocytes and plasma cells. Does it really matter? The answer is probably no. That said, what do I do? I'll call this mild chronic gastritis because that is, to my eye, is the dominant pattern. The dominant pattern is not reactive gastropathy. So I call things based on what is the dominant pattern. And now I'll very rarely make a diagnosis of chronic gastritis with reactive gastropathy-like changes. I prefer giving my clinician one diagnosis, one injurious agent to chase down. So let's look at a few cases of reactive gastropathy. These are hit me on the head type of reactive gastropathy. And frequently you can pinpoint the agent driving the reactive gastropathy. The most common agent turns out to be bile and the endoscopist will tell you that there's actually bile sitting in the gastric antrum or this patient has had a Billroth II surgery which allows for the reflux of bile into, into the stomach. But this is not bile reactive gastropathy. It's reactive gastropathy all right. There's beautiful serrations, that sawtooth-like configuration 
of the gastric pits. The gastric pits are elongated. Gee, isn't this pretty perfect serrated architecture? But look what's happening in the lamina propria. There is a bizarre increase in these small vascular channels. This is by no means normal. And if you don't believe me, here's a CD31 stain. Try this in the normal gastric antrum. You will never see an expansive excess of these tiny vascular channels. This is typical for portal hyperdensive gastropathy. When you see a reactive gastropathy-like pattern with a tremendous increase, or what I refer to as neovascularization of the lamina propria, think portal hypertensive gastropathy. Now this was virtually identical, which is why I'm showing you a very high power, but in addition to the neovascularization of the lamina propria, there is a thrombus, a platelet thrombus in a small vascular channels. And you guessed it right, this is gastric antral vascular ectasia. This is the so-called watermelon stomach, where you see these linear erythematous stripes in the gastric antrum on endoscopy. You could do a CD31 stain to prove that those are platelet thrombi. And here's, here are a couple of positive platelet thrombi. But the reality is, in my experience, that simply does not work. Now, this is something that you will not see every day. This is the gastric antrum, all right. And you can see a lot of the epithelium is lost. If you look closely at the epithelium, it does look a little scary but I can assure you this is not dysplasia, this is regenerative surface epithelium. What's the underlying etiology for this reactive gastropathy-like look? Oh, look at those little dark spots. These are Y90 spherules deposited here inadvertently during an embolization procedure in the liver. These emit radiation and hence you can see the most severe reactive gastropathy like changes in the stomach if they make their way into the stomach. So a very quick word on how I craft my report. This is specifically now for reactive gastropathy and I always specify the site that was biopsied. In this case it was gastroantral mucosa. It could be gastric body fundic mucosa it, or it could be gastric cardia. And then I'll say with reactive gastropathy. The one additional line that I always put down, I will put down the fact that I do not see Helicobacter pylori organisms on an hematoxylin and eosin stain slide. And I put that down for the endoscopist because I believe that is one positive thing that the endoscopist can take away from my report. In reality, you know, it's not positive, it's a negative thing. Nevertheless, it's an important parameter that I think does deserve inclusion in the report. Here's how I'd phrase my portal hypertensive gastropathy report and here's how I would phrase my gastric antral vascular ectasia report.